Hello everybody and welcome back to the Physio channel. In this video we have our patient with us, Rose, who has presented with a stiff neck. She's been doing a lot of athletic training and resistance training recently. So we're gonna have a look at her range of motion and then start to deliver some passive treatments. So you can see the kind of thing that I would do in practice. You can see some mobilizations, soft tissue work, and then we'll crack some tools out and we'll use some pods, uh, cups, and um, uh, some of the vibration tools as well. Now we've been through our assessment and we've checked most importantly for our cervical red flags, which I will pop up on the screen here. And you can have a quick read of those and we've made sure that Rose isn't presenting with any of those symptoms, which fortunately are rare in general practice, but are so important to make sure you screen for before treating a patient. We've also taken Rose through a neuro exam, testing her sensation, her muscle activation or myotomes, and her deep tendon reflexes around the bicep, tricep, and brachialis as well. So we're gonna get started with the treatment. Okay, so I'm gonna start with some passive work here. And the first thing I needed to do was to get Rose to relax her head because heads are heavy. In fact, they weigh about four and a half to five kilograms, which is surprisingly heavy if you hold that as a weight. So you'll know if you've got that weight in your hands, and if not, it indicates the patient's probably holding some of the weight of the head for you, and therefore their neck is still likely to be stiff and anything but relaxed. So with a good grip around the head, they should feel confident to relax, and that is a good starting point for some passive treatment. So I'm just gonna put the sides of my fingers there, my index finger on the sides of the vertebrae at an angle so that I'm not pressing onto those spinous processes, effectively having a good contact without discomfort. And I'm gonna move just in some gentle figure of eight movements, just to see if I can get Rose to relax that neck a little further. Okay, if I then come up towards the top of the head, I'm going to hook my fingers underneath the back of the head, so underneath the back of the occiput, and apply some gentle traction. And again, combine that with some gentle figure of eight movements, just to get the neck relaxed, and to get the patient relaxing as we move them passively. Okay. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is part assessment and part treatment. It's a mobilization of the neck of the cervical vertebrae. We're not gonna do a manipulation, but we may get some clicking or cavitation as we do this. So I think I should probably go from your side so you can see what I'm doing first. So once again, I'm gonna use the knuckle on the index finger, so a little further up the finger this time. Rotate the head slightly just to expose this area for me to get my hand in place. And again, I'm resting on the sides of the vertebral bodies, but not pressing on the spinous process. So I'm gonna start at the base of the neck, around the level of C6. Okay, I'm going to push sideways into the neck and then side flex towards you, towards the patient's left side. Okay, and that's the first thing I can do. So I press in and then side flex I can then move up to the mid cervical region, so around C5 and C4. Side flex over to the left. Moving up towards C3, C2. So what I'm looking for here is pain, range and end feel. I'm looking to see if any of these movements elicit pain for the patient which they may tell me, but also be quite self-evident from their facial expression. I'm also looking for range of motion as well. So I might find that there is a limit of right side flexion if the left side is tight. And I might find that a certain level of the spine seems to be more restricted than other parts as well. So it might be more restricted on the lower cervical spine or maybe more restricted on the upper cervical spine on the right hand side, for example. So I'm looking for those things. And also end feel. So there might be a slightly binding restriction to the movement when compared to the other side. And to me, that might indicate 
muscle tension. There might be more of a block to the movement where it moves and then suddenly feels like there's quite a definite objective block and that can often indicate a joint restriction where perhaps one of the vertebrae has been restricted for some time and that sort of thing clinically often responds well to either a more vigorous mobilization or potentially a manipulation as well when you have that blocked end feel because it tends to indicate that you're reaching the end of range for the joint at the moment rather than the end of range being limited by muscle tension and although you can manipulate with muscle tension sometimes if the muscle tension is the restricting issue then you might just be causing further aggravation if you're trying to manipulate something which essentially is more muscular. Now some of that is from my clinical experience and my, my opinions and of course like in terms of reading the research those things can really be pulled apart and discussed in much much greater depth but there is definitely a feeling that you get when you're working clinically with a patient and those feelings I'm talking about like the end feel of a joint can often give you a steer as to what type of treatment might work best for that dysfunction. Okay, following on from the mobilizations, which we could advance to manipulations, but we're not going to do those in this video because there are plenty of manipulation videos on YouTube already, and we may do some in the future, but for now I wanted to move on to show you a, a wider breadth of techniques for dealing with neck pain, because I know many viewers will not be qualified to deliver manipulation treatment and will want to see the many other things you can do to help deal with neck pain. So following on from the mobilizations where we were just creating that hinge with our hands and then side flexing and adding in the rotation, okay, like so. And particularly on this right side because therefore we're opening up the left side and stretching that left side. And we were just working within range, which means it's the natural movement of the neck and there's no forced movements going on, which can sometimes cause patients or therapists concern. So moving on now to the soft tissue techniques. One of the favorite techniques I like to do, and it does usually involve just a little bit of wax or emollient. I tend to prefer using a wax because it's a bit drier and you also get a little bit more friction between your hand and the skin which can just create a bit more of a warming effect. I find oil spreads too quickly and, 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 and your hand tends to slip too quickly and you get less resistance as you're moving through the technique. So I'm going to use the back of my fingers, my knuckles there and I'm going to keep my fingers nice and soft rather than a fist and then I'm going to move down off the back of the skull, so off the back of that occipital ridge there, down, over, and into the upper trapezius. And with my other hand, I'm holding the head so that I can move the head away into side flexion and a bit of flexion in order to open up that area that I'm treating. Okay, and this is a comfortable position for the patient Although one of the downsides is that the couch does kind of get in the way. So you run out of room as you move on to the upper traps there. You kind of want to go a little bit further, but the couch is in the way. So we'll have to move the patient in a moment and try some of these techniques in a different position. But while the patient's here, I'll show you a, another collection of treatments you can do. And these really target the suboccipital cluster of muscles and some of these cervical erectors more vertically down the back of the neck rather than out to the side. Angle your fingers at a, like a 90 degree angle to the couch and keep them as straight as possible whilst pressing into that suboccipital region. And the first thing you can do is just press and hold. So you're likely to be lifting the patient's head off the couch using the strength of your fingers in order to do that. Tuck those hands in underneath and ask the patient to relax, which often doesn't do the trick. So I tend to use cues like 
let your head go heavy or bring the breathing into it as well. So I say to patients, okay, just breathing normally, not deep breaths, but as you breathe out, let your head sink back into the couch let the head sink down between my hands. So I need to just open my hands up a little bit so that can happen. And Rose is doing that right now because I can really feel the strain on my fingers as I'm pressing into that suboccipital region. How are you feeling there, Rose? Are you nice and relaxed? Yeah, feeling good. Okay. This is a lovely technique and often feels really nice and can be particularly helpful for cervicogenic headaches. So if you've got a patient suffering from headaches and you are wondering what techniques you can try, I'd certainly recommend this one. Now there is a more advanced way of delivering this treatment. It just involves a bit of understanding from the patient, but it's quite straightforward and if they get it right, it can feel really nice. So let's have a go and see what Rose can do. Just lift your chin up a little, Rose, and relax. Okay, so the patient lifts their chin up a little bit, so you've got that upper cervical extension, and then they need to relax again to switch off the muscles on the back of the head. Rose, I want you to slowly, without lifting your head, slowly bring your chin down towards your chest. As I then start to straighten my fingers, and if I can get this zoomed in on the camera for you, which uh, we'll do now or in the editing, we'll have a look at that technique. So fingers in the suboccipital space on both hands. Then Rose has her chin up a little bit, and then as relaxed as possible, she actively brings her chin down, so that's upper cervical flexion. And at the same time, we then start to extend our fingers down towards the base of the neck. All right, and do that again. So chin up a little and relax. And then extending the fingers down the back of the neck. Okay. If you look at the top of the screen, I'll put a tab in to show you some links to some other videos on these techniques. So if you want to have a look at those, they're much the same, or if you want to refer back to those in the future to have a look at the technique in a, in a shorter video that's more succinct and you can quickly look up this technique or the other technique or the next one I'm gonna show you, then um, you'll find them in that playlist at the top of the screen. Okay. And there's one more we can do as well. One hand holding the head, the other hand's gonna come underneath using typically the middle finger to press into the suboccipital region. And this technique can be a little bit more precise. All right, so I'm just gonna let your head go there, Rose. Okay, so one hand holding the head, the other hand underneath using the middle finger to press into that suboccipital region that allows you to be more precise because you can then feel for any particular tight spots or reported tender spots. So you might refer to it as kind of a trigger pointing technique where you can really focus in on those, on those sore spots. So we'll just have a go, Rose. We're over on the left side, suboccipital region. One hand taking the weight of the head and then just pressing in with a more of a precision pressure and asking our patient, if they feel any particular tender points on that side. All okay? Yeah. Okay. All right, so whilst we're here, we'll go on the other side as well, just to be thorough. All right, so pressing in, releasing the pressure, relocating, just feeling around the back of that suboccipital region. Before we move the patient out of this supine position, we're going to do a little bit more. We're going to add in some METs or PNF, essentially um, some assisted stretching techniques. So I'm going to side flex away. So we're looking at stretching this left side, which of course was the side where there was some tension reported at the start of the treatment. Holding the shoulder down, we're then going to provide an assisted stretch. Now that's more comfortable for me, but you probably can't see that clearly on the camera. So I'm gonna switch my arm under here so you can clearly see where both hands are placed. All right, so working with the patient, tell me when you start to feel a light stretch. There, okay, so we only want a light stretch because remember a stretch feeling essentially indicates that the stretch reflex has kicked in and when that happens, the muscle starts to contract 
as a protective mechanism from stopping it being stretched any further. So if you're stretching too vigorously in the first place, then potentially you're going to be fighting against the reflex muscle contraction. So a light stretch is all that we need to begin with. And then I'm going to ask you to gently push your head into my hand. What we're looking to do here is contract the very same muscle that is being stretched. So Rose is trying to return her head back towards this position, which we've just adjusted for the purposes of the film. But we want to stay in that light stretched position, push into the hand and sustain that contraction. So by contracting the muscle that's being stretched, we actually desensitize that stretch reflex. We activate those Golgi tendon organs and then relax. After a few seconds, typically around six to 10 seconds, I find is plenty. The stretch reflex has been dampened down and you've then got a little bit more range that you can achieve before it kicks in again and then you repeat the process. But there's one other thing you can add in. So let me get Rose to push again for the 10 seconds. Okay, then after the 10 seconds, we can try and reset the position and see if we can gain some more side flexion, or if we get Rose to actively side flex away, then the activation of the opposite muscle group, pulling Rose further into right side flexion, stretching that left side. By getting the patient to actively move for you, it can make the technique that much better. Okay, bring you back to the center. So now in the seated position, it's a great position to treat the neck and it might actually be preferred, certainly by you as a therapist, although some patients prefer to be lying down if they're trying to relax. But in this position here, we've opened up the side of the neck here for treatment. I'm holding the front of Rose's head in my hand there, just to again, take some of the weight away from the head so she can relax as much as possible. And then I'm gonna use the back of my hand, keeping my hand uh, fist soft like that, so not knuckled, but just fingers out of the palm. Then I'm gonna glide down over the upper traps as we did in the supine position. But one of the benefits of this seated position is if we're coming down here, medial to the scapula, we've got the ability to move a little further depending on what the patient's wearing and the couch won't get in the way. So this is a easy position to treat up around the neck. Although you can treat up in the suboccipital region from this position here, I find that's best done as we just did in the supine position because there you can get the patient to relax and use the weight of their head in order to help with the treatment in terms of getting enough depth into the tissue. So we'll do a few more of these and then I want to start to introduce some of the treatment tools. So the first one, we'll use the rock blade, which is a form of instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization. And it's got a nice smooth beveled edge all the way around. So it feels particularly nice as you make contact with the skin and glide down over the skin. It's particularly helpful up around the neck because you can drop into that suboccipital space and even if the patient has a long hair like Rose here, the tool glides over the hair and doesn't pull on the hair and isn't uncomfortable. So it allows you to treat up into the hairline and the reason you might want to do that is to target that suboccipital region there, okay? So into the suboccipitals and then very slowly gliding down out over the upper trapezius. And I've just checked the temperature of the tool that I'm using here. I made sure the rock blade was warmed up because it was pretty cold when I grabbed it off the shelf. But you've also got an option there to play around with temperature. So you can have the, the tool really cold, which some patients might like. It might feel like some nice cryotherapy going down over their neck. or you can warm it up, making sure it doesn't get too hot, of course, and then it can feel like hot stone therapy down over the neck. And it just adds that little bit extra to that passive treatment. We can use one of the other edges of the tool to drop down over the extensors of the cervical spine there. And as I do that, I'll just ask the patient to slowly let the head nod forwards, 
let their neck flex forwards in combination with a slow movement down medial to the scapular border there, continuing down onto the thoracic extensors. So we'll just get you to do that again, Rose. Slowly dropping the head down, flexing the cervical spine and moving down into the medial scapular area there. Okay. I have just received, have just been released in the UK. If you're watching this video, you can check the date to see when that was. But uh, I've been working with Flow, Flow Sports Tech for a while now, and they've just released their Nano. And Rose hasn't tried this yet, so we're gonna, we're gonna give it a go. So we've got different ends that we can put onto the tool. Uh, I particularly like this double one here, this bifurcated one, because um, I think it lends itself well to going down each side of the spine, so we'll, we'll try that. So we'll pop that in the end there. And this also has something else, which at this time you won't find on any other massage tools, but let's just use the percussion end to begin with. So we'll switch it on. Okay. And we're gonna start around the level of C5 and slowly come down over C7, down over T1 and T2 there, and then we'll repeat that again. So coming down, the fork is going each side of the spinous processes. I've slightly angled the tool and I'm making sure I'm not putting too much pressure down into the tool and into Rose's neck because, well, to be honest, that would just be uncomfortable and uh, it certainly wouldn't achieve faster results. So we let the tool do the work. So Rose, if you can slowly lower your head now like you did with the rock blade just a moment ago. That's it. Brilliant. Flatter treatment head there so we can go over more of a muscular region. Okay, just tilt your head there and we'll come down over the upper trapezius region. And these tools pass over clothing quite easily. And in fact, particularly with some of the bigger, more vigorous guns, if the patient is wearing clothing, so a t-shirt or even a t-shirt and a jumper, for example, that can actually be beneficial for the use of the tool because it provides a bit of extra cushioning which means it can be a bit more comfortable for the patient rather than working directly on the skin. So if you do find these tools a bit too vigorous, then try different settings, perhaps try a smaller massage tool, or go over the clothing because that will give you some, um, some extra kind of absorption of the percussion force, but still feel really nice as well. Okay. Now the Flow Nano has a unique heating element at the end, which we haven't seen on a massage gun before, and Rose hasn't tried anything like that before either. So we're just gonna, press the button here and put it onto the highest setting because we want to give it a good go and uh, see what it feels like when it heats right up. And this should heat up now to 46 degrees in certainly a matter of seconds. I find it takes about 60 seconds to, uh, to warm up. Yep, that's warming up already. So I'm just going to let that warm up a bit more and then we'll try it on Rose's neck. I should warn her that it is going to feel warm just in case she thinks that the gun is starting to burn or uh, there's a problem with the electronics or the battery. Okay, so hold your neck. That's it, I'm gonna hold your head raised in that comfortable position again. I'm gonna use the heating element now, so it is gonna be warm. That's it. So I'm just gonna slowly move that down over your neck. Can you feel the heat? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I've used this quite a lot on my neck since I received this a couple of days ago and it does feel really nice. We're gonna to want to go on this in a moment, Rich, aren't you? <laughs> it looks great. Okay, well, Rose is enjoying that, guys, so <laughs> if you don't mind, we'll just carry on for a little longer because if it feels good and it's therapeutic, then we certainly want to make the most of that. So in clinic, if we had enough time, I probably would do a bit more of that because whenever you find anything that the patient finds particularly therapeutic, and it does vary between patients, of course, then often that's something that you want to do a bit more of and uh, certainly return to if that patient comes back to see you in the future. So I'm gonna switch that off now. What we're gonna do now is some cupping around the neck. So I'm gonna do two different things. Firstly, I've got a bit of wax on there already. I'm gonna take one of these cups, one of the standard rock pods, the black ones, pop that onto the neck. Okay, so 
just off the side of the neck, of course, in that upper trapezius region where Rose has been reporting some tension, although based on everything we've done now, that should be a lot less. Okay, so with that in place, I'm not just gonna leave it there because to be honest, that won't really do that much. Instead, I'm gonna use it as a handle to mobilize the soft tissue, I'm talking the skin and the deeper contractile tissue, the muscle below as well. So I'll just move my hand position so you can see what's going on, but uh, you should be able to see a good amount of skin movement around the periphery of the pod. And Rose should be able to feel that as well with some depth. How does that feel, Rose? Feels good. Yeah. Feels good, <laughs> that'll do, we'll take that. With these two in place, rather than me moving the pods, I'm gonna get Rose to move her neck. So Rose, can you drop your head forwards? Good, and then back to neutral. And then side flex, great. And side flex the other way over to your right. Fantastic. Now this is often described as feeling like an enhanced stretch or a self massage. As Rose is moving her neck into those end ranges, flexion and side flexion, the pods have created some tension and restriction to the soft tissue movement so that when she's moving away from the pods, there's a pull underneath the pod and there's a, uh, some soft tissue shearing that's being created. So what is typically a rather uneventful movement of side flexions, which most patients do and don't really get much out of, suddenly they're much more aware of the movement and they're much more likely to move into the end range, explore the movements, explore side flexion and flexion and different angles to try and change the pull on the skin and I find it encourages the movement as well. And as you can see from Rose here, she's just getting on with it herself and moving in all those different directions and feeling the stretch that's been enhanced by the shearing created by the tension underneath the cups. Now with the rock pods, when we teach the rock pods course here in the UK, one of the key things that we teach is not to leave the pods or cups on for too long because that will then allow you to minimize the markings that occur but also get the benefits of the treatment. So how long do we leave them on for? Well, we'd usually say about 30 to 90 seconds. 30 seconds if patients seem particularly sensitive and redden up quite quickly, or 90 seconds or beyond if patients don't really show much residual marking afterwards, which Rose doesn't actually. So for Rose, we tend to leave the pods on for a little longer. She's usually fine for two to three minutes uh, because we know that she doesn't tend to have much of an after effect or um, what we call ecchymosis after the potting. Okay, Rose, so that's that. Now we're gonna finish off with a bit of tape. So if you're working on tension in the upper trapezius, once you've done your passive treatments or your active passive treatments, then if you want to try some taping, I have had good reports from patients where we've just placed a little bit of symptom reduction tape over the top of the upper traps. So to do that, we have a pain-free stretch through here, which hopefully is improved after our treatments. We take some tape, place it from the base of the neck, rub to stick, and then that should feel comfortable or perhaps the patient shouldn't really feel it's there. I call that symptom reduction taping because if I'd added stretch to the tape, which I didn't, the tape didn't have any stretch, but if I stretch the tape purposefully, then that might be what we consider to be postural taping, where the pull of the tape is creating an increased sensory input, and that can sometimes lead the patient to want to lift their shoulder or lead to an increased uh, habitual activation of the upper traps, which is not really what we're looking for here. We're looking for relaxation. So symptom reduction taping means that we stretch the patient, not the tape, and then when the patient returns to neutral, the tape is not pulling on the skin. It's just sitting there in a relaxed state but has plenty of elasticity should the patient want to move. The tape's got plenty of give in it, so it's not going to restrict movement at all. So I better just check. Rose, is that okay? Is that comfortable? Can you tell it's there? No. no? All right. Well, that's ideal. We don't really want the patient to know that it's there. Otherwise, it's going to be somewhat irritating for them. But the advice I would give in all occasions would be take the tape off at any point if it's itching or irritable. Okay? And uh, of course, before I put the tape on, in our assessment, we've done some pre-checks to make sure that Rose has used tape before. 
uh, doesn't have any skin sensitivities or allergies, and there was no identified reason why she couldn't try some tape if she wanted to. Okay, so take that tape off at any point if it's itching or irritable. Otherwise, we'll leave it on for, let's say, um, 48 hours in this instance. Okay, so we're gonna show Rose now three exercises that she can be getting on with at home. And I find that these exercises are usually well received by patients and I get positive reports of patients benefiting from them, but also doing them. Because as my colleague Richard would say, the best exercise is the one getting done. And I couldn't agree more. Right, so for this one, I'm just gonna ask Rose to keep her head down on the couch or at home on the floor. So let your chin raise up. So you've got the upper cervical extension and then chin down. That's it, upper cervical flexion. If you're watching this thinking we need to do something a bit more vigorous, that's what we're gonna do next, something that involves a bit more muscle action. For this next exercise, Rose is going to be performing shoulder shrugs, which of course utilizes the neck muscles as well. So the instruction is to start with the shoulders down and then lift those shoulders right up, trying to get them to touch the ears, maximizing the range of motion, and then back down again. There's no rush with this, so it can be done at a slow pace so that you can really maximize the range of motion and really feel the movement. And by moving slower as well, you've got the muscles under tension for longer. So more time under tension, which is no bad thing. As an example here, I might say to Rose, do three full range, slow repetitions. Then after the third repetition, do some side flexion of the neck to Stretch those side flexors over to the left, that's it. And then slowly over to the right as well. Getting a good stretch back to the center and repeat. So for this final exercise, it's about improving cervical rotation. Now, some research has shown that it's not always a physical block to rotation. In fact, it's often rarely a physical block to rotation. It perhaps might be an anticipation of pain which is causing the limited rotation, then it might be based on how far they've perceived their rotation to be, which is typically they know they've gone so far or visually they can see that they've turned their head so far based on the, the movement of the scenery in front of them. There's some interesting virtual reality research which I'll pop into the description below this video should you want to look at that further. But for those of us that don't have virtual reality technology in order to help our neck pain patients, then here's a simple thing you can do. So when Rose rotates her head, she's experiencing some stiffness, or she was before she came to see us for treatment. So instead, we're gonna get Rose to keep her head still. I'm gonna ask her to focus on a point on the wall, fixed point, and just keep her head facing that point. And then, because she's on a rotating office chair, I'm gonna ask Rose to rotate her body while she keeps her head still. So Rose might think that she's not turning her head. Of course, she knows she's turning her head, but you can see the difference here is that as far as the brain and the eyes are concerned, the head is still facing forwards, but the body is rotating. And by changing the movement context like this, we can often reduce fear of movement, reduce kinesiophobia, and in real life, see some improvements in neck range just by changing the way we move and its perception. All right, so I've shown Rose what to do now. I'm gonna take my hands away and see if she can do that herself because this is, of course, one of her home exercises. That's it, good. Excellent, keeping the head facing forwards, letting the chair spin and rotating as far as possible. All right, so we've sent Rose on her way now and she's booked in again to come back and see us in a week's time. Her neck was moving better after the session today. So we started off by mentioning the assessment that we did ultimately before the video. And then we went through a range of passive treatments, lots of hands-on and then introducing some treatment tools as well. And Rose particularly liked the heat element on the end of the new Flow Nano. And then we gave Rose her three home exercises 
made sure she was happy doing them and hopefully that should lead to some ongoing resolve of her neck stiffness over the next few days. So that's it for this video guys. Please have a look at the video showing on the screen here which you may find helpful. Hopefully you've subscribed to the Physio channel now. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.